Hello everyone, this is Garzig and welcome to a Legends of Runeterra patch review. This was the big, big patch that we've been waiting for for a very long time. Riot had hyped it up for four, saying that there was going to be a lot of card changes coming. And uh, I want to talk about it. We had some pretty important nerfs, some big misses, and also some hints about what might be coming in the future. So let's jump right into it. Okay, so to start things off um, for the patch notes, I am just going to kind of skim over them. I think that everybody who was really anticipating these patch notes has probably read them all already, but I just want to highlight some key points kind of give my thoughts about where I think the meta is going to shift and uh, focus a little bit more on the wider pattern and implications of the patch notes. So uh, let's get into it. First things first, new cards. Riot had already confirmed that they wanted to try a balance experiment with this patch as well. And this is what they are doing. We're experimenting with a new approach to live design this patch. In addition to the usual uh, card updates, we've taken a holistic look at gameplay patterns that aren't easily or quickly addressable by changing existing cards. So instead, we're adding a few new cards, which is fantastic. Um, one thing I've talked about extensively on my stream, uh, you know, link in description, make sure you follow the streams, you can see me live and we can have these discussions live, um, was that certain region combinations and deck archetypes just lacked certain tools to deal with um, mechanics and deck styles that were consistently meta, right? Like there's always going to be some sort of elusive base deck, some sort of aggressive uh, burn style deck in the metagame. And there were just certain decks that were always weak to those sorts of things. And so could never realistically see any wide meta play. And now that they're kind of opening up the floodgates to plug up the holes in certain decks in certain regions by giving them new targeted special cards is amazing. Like this is this is a completely different way to affect the metagame by saying, well, instead of nerfing this deck um, directly, we can add more tools to the game to deal with this deck. And this was sort of an argument that cropped up in the earlier days of Runeterra where there were certain things that were only strong because we lacked the tools to deal with them. And we've sort of seen that uh, play out over time and become truer and truer as we got more cards and more tools. So I'm really excited for this particular uh, direction for sure. And the cards that they went with, um, I'm not entirely sure they're going to do a lot, but I think that for something so, again, experimental, uh, it's certainly the thought that counts. Uh, so for the most part, when I envision Desert Duel, it might bring some Renekton decks out of the woodwork, um, but I am not certain this is going to see widespread play just off of like a first pass. Celestial Wonder um, is the new Targon card, uh, five mana, s fast speed stun two enemies. So for two more mana, we get a fast speed Crescent Strike that is main deckable. You don't have to jump through the extra hoops of having to invoke it, which I think is quite good. Um, the additional context, which again, I really love about these patch notes is um, the context that they're giving for these changes. Uh, Targon's great at creating large single threats, um, but can struggle with wider boards. While we don't want to change that identity entirely, this is important as well because Targon is supposed to be weak to uh, wider boards. It was one of their initial, you know, design properties, one of their inherent weaknesses. And it kind of ended up, you know, in the early days of Targon dominance and ended up not mattering that they were weak to swarm because they just had so much healing that um, you couldn't beat them down anyways, even though they couldn't really keep up with the board. Right. And then you could always get things like Meteor Shower that would help out with that. And so this, again, doesn't directly remove the board the way a Meteor Shower might. But uh, fast speed stun means that you um, are going to be in an interesting pickle where you want to open attack versus Targon to play around some of their slower answers. But when you do, you're playing in Celestial Wonder. So I think that this is probably going to be an interesting one of card in those control Targon decks, especially the ones that maybe only rely on one or two star shaping. Or if you have Aurelian Saul for your late game, you just need to get there. 
uh, Celestial Wonder, I think it's actually pretty good. I don't think this is going to make, you know, Yasuo come out of nowhere, but this card I kind of like to compare to Moonlight Affliction, and this I think is a great, a great addition to the game. Um, next up is Rocket Barrage. Five mana slow speed, deal three to an enemy, and one to all other enemies. Uh, direct damage is meant to be a strength of P and Z, and while that was definitely the case for single targets, their AoE options were not living up to that dream. Rocket Barrage should help keep Piltover and Zon as a strong option to look, to uh, look towards when you want to ensure your deck can deal with a horde of little aggressors. Uh, this is a pretty interesting point to make because uh, P and Z was normally paired with Shadow Isles or Freljord and for in order to make use of their AoE options. And so P and Z actually getting some AoE options of its own means that we can maybe start doing like P and Z Ionia a bit more reliably, P and Z Targon a little bit more reliably. It is important to note that Rocket Barrage is five mana and not six. So that, um, you know, this isn't going to go directly into like a Heimerdinger Lux to get the Lux level up and get those elusive turrets and things of that nature. But this is, again, uh, the attempt for Riot to kind of accentuate one of the intended strengths of P and Z. A lot of their AoE, things like um, Static Shock, True Shot Barrage have just been like too expensive for what they do. And Static Shock notably gets annihilated by Ranger's Resolve. And I think that Rocket Barrage is probably going to end up in the same way. Uh, you can float your turn two and play this on turn three. So if your opponent's just kind of uh, curving out against you willy-nilly, the ability to, to do three to one and then one to all other um, does a nice, um, a nice spread for sure, where you can soften up the board and maybe just set up your one drop or whatever you have in play to, to clean up the rest. So I am certainly looking forward to seeing if this card will be able to hang on. I think that Ranger's Resolve is still going to be a pretty big issue. And one of the reasons that PNZ's removal stays like mediocre is it's so like binary around specific targets but this is perhaps similar enough to meteor shower that it could see some mild play because meteor shower i feel is a card that uh, targon would love to main deck if they could uh, and so getting beyond the new cards um i wish there were more to be honest um but um, again, this balance experiment, if it is received well, Riot certainly would no doubt continue uh, wanting to do things like this. So make sure you you keep give them their feedback, right? They're going to be looking at the data and see how much these new cards actually do affect the meta as a whole and the regions and matchups that they're supposed to affect, right? I'm looking forward to this specific style of change because, um, if you, again, if you tune into the stream, there are a lot of archetypes that are just missing like one or two cards that if they get that dedicated help like this um, could really, really benefit. Something like Frostbite, something like Nightfall. Um, that's a big one I've been saying for a long time is that Nightfall needs a one or two drop, an additional one that has Nightfall on it that they can attack with that progresses like that Nocturne level up, gives them a little bit more uh, early synergy that isn't just, you know, Duskbringer and the Flight, which are fantastic cards for the archetype, but don't have Nightfall. So it's like you you don't pivot into or build up into anything later in the game. Uh, but you know that's a that's a different discussion. If you do want to hear more thoughts from me about Nightfall, uh, let me know in the comments below. Uh, now for the card updates, this is very very important thing that I do want to point out here. They need to, they gave some extra context because they did not nerf Yordles and Arms or the Bandle Tree. Uh, for Yordles and Arms, we work on these patches several weeks in advance, and we worked on this one earlier than usual due to our week out. Yeah, so uh, some of the rioters recently did go on a another like week long vacation, and so they had to sort of figure out what they were going to do for the patch, uh, and weren't of course able to catch everything per se. Um, the skilled Roy had actually posted a video recently going over some like patch history and data and the previous like balance patch that we got a while ago, 
Yorls and Arms had not yet uh, become as prominent in the meta. I think it was probably just before that happened, or maybe even a consequence of that patch. It wasn't seeing nearly as much plays when these changes were locked in, but they are watching it now. They're going to keep an eye on it, and hopefully, you know, with the Celestial Wonder and Rocket Barrage, plus other things in these patch notes, again, like Loping Telescope and Conch being nerfed, for example, Sharp Sight being nerfed, spoilers, maybe the Yordles and Arms decks just kind of fall by the wayside. We'll have to see. Uh, the Tristana variant might get toned down a little bit, but like the Lulu Fizz variant is probably going to be uh, pretty spooky too, especially again, Fizz being, you know, not really caring about a lot of these. If your opponent opens their turn with Yordles and Arms, Rocket Barrage isn't going to do anything uh, for Celestial Wonder. You can't target Fizz with it or else they potentially make this fizzle the entire spell. You don't get two stuns either. So a lot of elusive damage coming through this. Uh, these changes here are just kind of like, OK, we want to stop wide boards, but like dealing with elusive specifically while the game has gotten better about offering those sorts of tools. Um, we're going to need to see a little bit more help in that in that regard. But anyway, uh, the forbidden buff has finally happened. Moon weapons are back down to two mana. Um, they're just offsetting. This is what Gifts Beyond used to be was a two mana spell. When they increased the cost of moon weapons, they reduced the cost of Gifts from Beyond. And we'll have to see how this lands. We'll definitely have to see how this lands. I'm very scared. A lot of players were kind of um, you know, sad and frustrated that they didn't get to play Aphelios anymore. After his nerf, he, he, he was just gone. It wasn't like, oh, he got less play. He was just completely gone from the metagame. And it's only very, very recently that Aphelios has started to creep his way uh, back in, right, with like Aphelios Lux and things of that nature. Um, the change to Crescendum finally fixes the uh, the Eye of the Dragon interaction. Rather than tutoring a two-cost follower from your deck, you just summon a two-cost follower from your regions. And I did prefer the change of uh, summon a sky shadows. I thought that that was a pretty cool idea because you had to behold a nightfall card in order to get the mana refund, but you were just summoning a pretty decently static unit, I think, for, for two mana. And, and having that chump blocking option was kind of cool, right? But the important thing to note is that you aren't going to run out of units in your deck with a crescendo. So you can just keep cycling this, keep playing this, Keep phasing the crescendum into the gravitum. Now that the Felios is back, I have to like re-remember how all the phasing works. The opinion I've given on Aphelios a lot is that the moon weapons should not be tied to needing to be the same cost, in my opinion, because they very clearly are not created equal. Gravitum is going to be incredibly annoying uh, going forward. But... Hey, you know, at least Eye of the Dragon gifts from beyond change. Hooray. So we'll have to see how this this lands. I think that that Aphelios is going to be quite strong once again. Again, Calibrum, Gravitum are really the big heavy hitters for the moon weapons. The the Crescendum was mostly for Lee Sin purposes, but they do acknowledge as well that uh, Crescendum limited their ability to make two strong, uh, strong two drops. And we're even seeing that again with Aphelios Lux, right? Using Crescendo to get Petrocyte Broadwing. Um, Azir finally getting a little bit more love. Azir's love of units and Shurima's love of landmarks led to some internal strife, especially in Shurima-only decks. This change will help Azir players feel better about their board, no matter how they're filling it. I think that um, in, with the right build, you can hyper-level Azir in Sundisk. I think that this is actually a massive change. Sundisk, again... Another one of those decks that was just barely on the fringes of the metagame was actually seeing a lot of a lot of play. I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to say success, but I have certainly been seeing it a lot more recently. Um, and then with like the new Desert Duel, maybe Azir Renekton wants to come back into the mix. The uh, newest build, of course, is just Azir Zareth where you have this landmark synergy, the direct damage and finishing potential of level three Zareth, and now we have the level three Azir Emperor's deck coming online a lot more quickly. 
And yeah, I'm I'm definitely hyped for it. Next up, Nar just getting a little bit of a slap on the wrist, uh, nerfing those base stats a bit. And so uh, the changes that players had kept suggesting about like changes to Pokey Stick, making the Pokey Stick fleeting, removing Quick Attack from his leveled up form, uh, maybe even making it only create Pokey Stick on Attack Strike. There was again leading up to this patch, it was a fever pitch of you know, balance suggestions and balance wish lists from the community. I wrote a big one myself that we went over on stream. We did massive discussion streams, uh, going over everybody else's balance wish list to see where we agreed and disagreed. And they decided to just touch NAR ever so slightly. Uh, I think that NAR is still quite strong, just not as like auto include splashable, right? You certainly do want to put him in a deck that can maybe defend him a little bit more. Uh, three mana with quick attack is a lot, uh, it's a big difference between four mana with quick attack because it's, it's a lot easier to, uh, use a defensive combat trick to survive that trade and maybe swing back in. I think the most prominent NAR deck right now, of course, is just, uh, Trundle NAR timelines and NAR is still perfectly acceptable in that deck because you just want a ro a speed bump for your opponent that also gives you card draw. So. Nar kind of just keeps doing what he's already doing. He just doesn't like solo the game. I, we've seen tons of games with Nar. He levels up and then you've got vulnerable on the strongest enemy. And then he swings on you for six damage, either sniping a key target or, you know, one of the other followers in play pulls that unit to the side and Nar gets to threaten you with like six direct damage. Um, so we won't be hitting you for as much. Notably, there are no changes to wallop here. Um, which is also kind of a big shame. Uh, but you got to remember too, when Poppy was kind of in the mix, it took a few rounds of nerfs for her to finally get toned down. So we'll see if just reducing Nar's play, play rate a bit, maybe sort of nicheifying him does make sense. Although to be fair, this doesn't do a whole, whole lot in my opinion. Uh, Pantheon also getting toned down, uh, just making him a four mana three, two. Um, this slows him down ever so slightly. Uh, the big problem with Pantheon is that when he comes down with Barrier, it's kind of like a pretty big AoE stun, right? Because you don't want to swing into the Barrier and give Pantheon value. And then with Faded, you know, he's potentially going to get plus three, plus three, or, or plus two, plus two that round. So he comes, he's technically like a five mana, uh, like six, four with Barrier, and it, it's definitely pretty rough. And even if you had a ping to stop the barrier, because of that faded proc, you're able to cover the combat, you're able to cover removal, and it, it just wasn't, like, worth it to take such a huge risk to try to answer the Pantheon. But the, the big change that I would like to see for Pantheon, we know everybody kind of wants him to get toned down, uh, but one attack I don't think is really going to do it. I guess that this might make him not one shot you as consistently the games where he's been exact lethal to kill you you might survive with one or two hp then but who knows if the game is even winnable at that point um but this is basically just because of yumi right the feline friend yumi just scales pantheon way too hard because you don't really care about leveling up quickly when he's just getting big stats plus overwhelm plus faded potential to get spell shield um uh, a lot of players myself included probably just wanted scout taken out of the pool um high rolling uh elusive plus life steal etc was already kind of a mess and i would really love to see the numbers on how many games you die to saga seeker or wounded white flame and pantheon doesn't really matter in that equation uh next up we've got a nerf to pike uh this is a pretty pretty wild to see i think that this nerf would need to happen at some point we've talked about lurk extensively i played a ton of lurk on the stream um it's what i got master tier with last season um it's a very very good deck and they even acknowledge it here it's been a consistent force for a good bit of time um, it hasn't been like insanely popular compared to a lot of other decks, especially decks with, I think, much higher win rates on average. It's just that the nature of this deck 
is very unsatisfying to play against. And so by taking one attack point off of Pike, it means that if I go first, I lurk on turn one, and then I attack you again and lurk on turn two. I don't have a four attack Pike that's also going to blow out your potential four, three or four mana play on turn four, and then just get like completely in wreck like irreconcilable tempo and end the game. Uh, so Pike and Death from Below are still going to be like really strong mid late game hitters, but we don't have that very specific high roll of I have Death from Below, the game is over, right? Especially against those sorts of decks that sort of need to play on curve and try to keep up with Lurk. The change a lot of players did want to see is making it so that the Lurk proc for Pike was visible to both players, so you knew when your opponent had death from below and you could plan accordingly. Um, or maybe even uh, changing death from below to slow speed. That way if Lurk is uh, ever falls behind or gets a bad clunky draw, etc., uh, Pike becomes less of a get out of jail free card because you're able to just punt like just open attack and, and not have to worry about it. So um, I think that this change is certainly a lot more impactful than people realize. It's just that Lurk is also one of the decks that is supposed to kind of give Bandal City a hard time because you have like early fearsome damage and overwhelm and sort of tempo oriented gameplay that they maybe don't care. Uh, they, they can't really get set up as easily as they want to. And so the, this nerf does feel perhaps a little bit poorly timed. Uh, but and, and they even nerf Dunebreaker. They say it here, but further down in the patch notes, Dunebreaker also losing a point of HP means you aren't going to get those multiple reps of overwhelm for consistent closing potential. And uh, 5 HP means that, you know, buffing up a unit to trade up into it is going to be a, perhaps a bit more reliable or even cards like Piercing Darkness or, you know, Chump plus Ravenous Flock are able to reach those heights a little bit more consistently. This change to Rumble was one I wanted to see. Um, this was like basically on my wish list. I didn't have too many specific ideas about Rumble, but I wanted him to be put more in a position where you wanted to run more of the mecha yordle package so they made it so uh rumble doesn't just need to deal damage himself to level up uh seeing other mecha yordle allies deal damage will also count for rumble's level up so rumble plus on average one other mecha yordle attacking will level up uh rumble which i think is very very cool the big problem with mechs in my opinion they they went ahead and buffed some of the uh, mecha yordles but the biggest issue with them in my opinion wasn't that they weren't good enough it was that in order to get them it was a bit too slow right it didn't matter that you could play this really cool unique card when you had to discard a card play an understated unit and then also spend man on the dune hopper mech um, we still run into the issue of needing to build your deck a very specific way to enable Rumble to come down with all of his keywords, and then you have less utility to respond to the opponent unless you curved out in a very specific way. Um, we'll see what this enables. Um, could be Rumble Lulu stuff, which I did try out very briefly during the Forbidden Yordle, uh, Yordle Explorer meta with Yordle Captain. Um, if that sort of slow value is where Mecha Yordles end up, I'm definitely stoked to try it. You know, Rumble with Scion. There's a lot of different ways. They're even buffing Victor here. Hexcore upgrade now costs zero. This is what a lot of people wanted to see at the very least for Victor. Um, I feel like Victor is a champion that Riot was always afraid would be too strong and too snowbally. I've said multiple times that the previous Shell Folk meta that we got sort of gave us a taste of what Victor could do if he was firing on all cylinders, where he's discounting cards, glorious evolution, blah, blah. And uh, the keyword sharing certainly perhaps does matter. Um, but this this is a step in the right direction. I don't think that that Victor's going to be that great just because 
you know, you get to play them on four and then also you get a keyword because your first couple keywords still need to be really, really, really strong uh, for for Victor to matter. I think he's still a bit too much of a tempo loss as a four mana three, four with an extra step. But who knows, you know, with Rocket Barrage, maybe helping you hold down the early mid game. Uh, maybe he just can stick around and, and get those keywords more consistently. Um, but, you know, I again, like I said, the 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 mechs, mecha girls, I felt like they were already pretty good. The extra stats are just kind of icing on the cake. If they really want to push Mecha Yordles, then they probably need to directly buff Squeaker and uh, build Rascal, etc., etc. But we all know that Scrap Heap is probably the most playable. So uh, Scrap Heap on, you know, turn one or turn two, Rumble on four, off to the races, especially if you get Fury Horn Crasher off of uh, Scrap Heap, start snowballing the game that way. It's going to be a really fun time. Um, and again, Zersai Dune Breaker nerfed. Catalyzer nerfed. A lot of players wanted to see this at the very least, so that Catalyzer can't like fight for the board as much in the early mid game. Uh, by making Twisted Catalyzer a two mana two two, it means that um, Zersai Hatchling and even Zersai Caller can now swing in on this and just push through a little bit more tempo. Not trading evenly, opening up darkness it has a bit more weakness to fearsome is going to be pretty big. Um, where they have to get to round four and play, uh, you know, still to Robe Maker or something to, to block Fearsomes. I don't know if this is going to open up specifically a Fearsome deck. The only one we really have right now is Spiders, which is, I think, pretty mediocre right now. But again, sure, the, the Catalyzer is nice to see. And against certain decks, it's still going to do the same thing that it always does, is you get two Catalyzers in your opening hand, and then your first darkness is hitting for four damage or something like that. And then you just rule the mid game because of it. And we'll see where um, if darkness can, you know, keep up. I think that darkness's play rate is going to go down just because the uh, newer people who have picked up darkness um, and aren't as invested in the deck aren't going to go that extra distance to still uh, make sure that it is good and playable. Uh, with the meta kind of going back into a fluctuated state after a big patch, um, these slower decks do need to kind of just see where the meta is shifting so they know what text to run, right? So um, the dedicated Darkness players, I think, are going to be just fine with the Catalyzer and the Conchologist nerf. Uh, maybe go back to running Hapless Aristocrat for more just general defense in your early mid game. And uh, yeah, we're off to a good start. We'll see if there's going to be further nerfs for Darkness, but it just kind of depends on where everything else ends up. Uh, Vanguard Sergeant finally getting set back down to a 3-3. A lot of players did want to see this change. Um, this, is, this does hit Scouts, which is nice. And again, they're, they're already saying here, right, that for Demacia and just having like a 3-mana three 3-4 three, was just too good for Scouts. And this was something that we've talked about extensively on recent streams. And um, it is very difficult to buff Demacia meaningfully without just making scouts uh better and so if they to you know tone this down a little bit and see where scouts can end up or again maybe add new cards to scouts specifically that force you to run like more of a synergistic package with more Demacia Bilgewater stuff in it um maybe that's the the route that we want to go and this is probably the biggest line in the patch notes here that I'm super excited for. Uh, returning this one back, but going to look at more changes to elites in a future patch. Uh, elites is an archetype that I think really has a lot of potential. Um, the like the origins of the deck were just Demacia has the best stats on average and you just play the best stats in the game on curve. And then you snowball the game with, uh, you know, Vanguard Bannerman and everybody kind of had a bad time. Everybody remembers 37-3 Demacia, where not only did you have really ridiculous stats, um, you also had Zed so that if you were forced to trade down versus Demacia, then Zed was having a path cleared for him to hit you in the Nexus or he would be the one that would clear your board and open up a path for the for the elites. 
especially against slower decks. It, it was an, it was a mess. And this was even before like Sharp Sight and Ranger's Resolver in the game. They just had Buku stats. Um, so I, I like that they recognize that, again, Demacia needs a redistribution of its power budget. Notably, there is no nerf to Golden Aegis here, which I was kind of hoping would get elitesified, where like you need to behold an elite or um, maybe only your elites could attack that round, but it would still remain a strong rally. Um, but I digress that I am looking forward to more elite changes in the future patch, not just making elites better, have more stats, but also some slight reworks to increase their overall synergy where, you know, if you have an elite do X, get, uh, you know, give an elite Y rather than just my elites get bigger and bigger. And I have a lot of them. These are certainly the big ones here. Conchologist to a 2-1, and Loping Telescope is now a 3-mana 2-2. Two, two. Um, I think that Conchologist as a 2-1 is perfectly fine, because, you know, Loping Telescope as a 2-1 was also perfectly fine and playable. This just means that uh, Conchologist isn't going to be fighting you for the board as hard. You can use pings to move it out of the way, but it's still going to give you that fantastic uh, just value and extra card. Um, and then Loping Telescope, a 3-mana 2-2 is still playable, right? We know this from Solari Priestess, who was a 3-mana, you know, 1-2 up until recently. And this is just going to make it so that, you know, the, the specific mixture of Vandal City's early mid-game isn't so standardized. And it, excuse me, kind of lowers the snowballing potential of the Fey decks with Gleaming Lantern and Bandle City decks with Loping Telescope having like that two mana play that also got you a good card. This is not the change I wanted to see. I don't think anybody would have minded Loping Telescope remaining at two mana if they fixed the epic rarity slot. The big thing to note is that these cards were just so prominent and so popular that the blowouts that I think are rare were just happening way more often just because you were running into these cards every other game. And again, these changes were locked in quite a long time ago, and who knows if they will further rework Loping Telescope because I've seen some pretty interesting ideas from the community. The change I 100% advocate for is that, um, the, that it manifests a celestial unit that only costs three or less, so it can't get Equinox or Crescent Strike anymore. And it's definitely more of a bandle flavored card to have a unit that gives you another unit because it also gives you a multi-region follower. And then instead of the epic rarity slot, just make that a random slot, right? Where if you get offered a celestial unit or a multi-region follower you don't like, you can choose the third option that will give you a different random celestial unit or multi-region follower. So you can kind of press your luck to get something that's perhaps a little bit better if those two options are just you know, terrible, the same way that you have like the option to skip when you predict and get a uh, fourth card. Uh, Paddle Star, also getting a bit of a buff. Uh, this card has never, ever seen play. So the fact that it deals more damage, uh, I don't think is going to change much. This is probably great to get off of uh, Conchologist now. If you're running like a Targon Bandle City, style of control deck paddle star is going to be great it's going to be like black spear where something is hit hit against you and then you're able to just like you know go right back at them with the paddle star five damage is a pretty big number um so perhaps this change is a bit more impactful than i realize it's just that i've been playing some leona swain lately and that's i think the only deck that's actually run paddle star this is technically also a buff to zoe because her her champion spell is Sleepy Trouble Bubble into Paddle Star. But uh eh, we'll see if if this is really the way they want to go. Uh answering things at slow speed, I think, is fine. Because it's not just the enemy has attacked you this round, it's that the enemy is also stunned. So this does shore up the daybreak package to give them like a really, really massive tempo swing. Could be interesting to see because Daybreak can't truly float a lot of mana. It's a deck that kind of wants to play on curve. I'm excited to experiment with this, though, because it's one of those cards that kind of like Weight of Judgment has some very strong applications, but they just weren't ever common enough to justify its use. This Quicksand change is crazy. 
um, rather than just giving one enemy minus four, it now has an additional option where you can give two enemies minus two and you still get the keyword disabling. This makes Quicksand a powerhouse defensive card. Um, a lot of elusive uh, decks, a lot of swarm decks are trying to just like beat you up and go wide. Um, Shurima has very little healing. I think the only healing it actually does have is Runa's Path and Devoted Council. And those are like very niche. Even Runa's Path was only seeing play in like the most aggressive of Shurima decks. It's not considered like a sustain card. Uh, so this is, this is godlike on defense. It's so easy to have three mana open at any given time. And it's going to be so risky to attack into Shurima now. I think this change might be too strong. This sort of card at at this power level might need to be four mana um, because Quicksand, in my opinion, is one of the cards I love to run in my Xerath Zillion that I've been spamming a lot. Um, it's great for, you know, trying to scoop up those keyword soup lists. The minus four attack means that not only are you stopping a lot of damage, but you get a trade. And this is this is just icing on the cake. This is further enabling uh, Renekton alongside Desert Duel. And this is one of the reasons I think that uh, Sun Disk is going to be pretty spooky in this next uh, in this uh, next patch because of the Azir changes and now giving them so such a powerful defensive tool here with Quicksand. Uh, and then furthermore, we've got She Who Wanders. This is actually a reversion. I think that She Who Wanders is now fully reverted, right? To the beta form where it's a 10 mana 10, 10 with regeneration. Um, and I think they made it a, they took away the regeneration. I think they made it a nine, nine at one point. Now it's back to a regeneration 10, 10. And now it can obliterate uh, for all units. The important thing to remember is that She Who Wanders was changed so that it would only uh, obliterate units and not champions. But now they're just putting that right back in. Uh, everybody's just going to ramp up to 10 and then just annihilate your opponent with She Who Wanders. Notably, Epic Rarity. You can still get this off of Loping Telescope. This card is not fun to play against. <laughs> um, I'm very, very surprised that, uh, that Riot went ahead with this change. Because late game Freljord already has buried in ice it has feel the rush it has um it's it's just it's a bit it's a bit too wild right and not just late game freljord it's also the fact that you also have the late game of whatever region you're also pairing it with so i i imagine that this is if, if freljord control does catch on a bit harder because it's already seeing a lot of play in the metagame because of Trundle timelines. Feel the rush is still floating around. Um, I've seen some golden ramp, right? The uh, Demacia Freljord ramp. Uh, this is just going to blow out a lot of decks. Like any mid range deck just kind of folds to this because all of your chump blockers are taken out of the equation. Your champions are potentially removed from the board and from your hand. It's, I'm really not looking forward to playing against this, especially with Targon's peak still in the game. Um, I imagine that day one, someone is going to get high rolled. Targon's peak on five, and Ishii who wanders on six. Potentially Targon's peak on four, depending on how good your draws are. And Ishii who wanders on five. And then you just can't, you can't, it's like impossible to win the game from that position. Unless you're also running just an incredibly heavy hand, and you're able to like play something super big. Uh, Lariat Rose gets a bit of a baby buff when I'm summoned. Grant all enemies vulnerable. Again, granting vulnerable is an incredibly powerful ability. Um, very underrated over the course of the game. This is another great epic rare that maybe Loping Telescope can give you. Uh, but getting plus one, plus one to the base stats is uh, pretty cool. I did see some suggestions. Uh, the share the the Lariat Rose enjoyers wanted her to have the tough keyword, which is perhaps a bit too out of flavor for Bilgewater specifically. But eh, I mean, if you were to like run something like this in Scouts, she's still competing with Genevieve and uh, C3 of the Bold, right? So it's really uh, still going to be a point where the card is better, but she does still not have a real deck to go into.
Next up, Sharp Sight. Uh, the al um, it's just it only gives plus one attack instead of plus two, and uh, it still has all the other properties of being able to buff elusives. Twin Disciplines also losing a point of attack. Um, so it's no longer symmetri symmetrical, but they are leaving it at two mana, um, which I disagree with. I think that everybody was very much on board with the Sharp Sight nerf. I saw this a lot in the uh, a lot of the balance wish lists, and a, a lot of players I think were under the impression that certain Demacian cards would get buffed to compensate for a Sharp Sight nerf. And so, like the Fey deck losing the extra power of Sharp Sight. Um, losing the extra power of Conchologist and Loping Telescope, messing with their curve a little bit, maybe slowing them down, maybe just keeps the deck from functioning the way it wants to, especially with, again, the new cards added to the game, with the meta shifting, who knows where we're going to end up, but I think this change should have happened for Sharp Sight, but it should have happened alongside some other changes to Demacia, like in, a, in the future Elites patch that they were hinting at. Um, a lot of the decks that are splashing Demacia right now, like Silver Auction, um, probably still okay because uh, you just really care about the HP in those decks in order to keep your units alive rather than using it to abuse the quick attack um, in some other lists. And this, is, this sort of ties into the nerf to Pale Cascade that happened a while ago and by a certain measure shaped stone where the ability to cheaply allow very small units to trade up into larger units was just too damaging to the ability for certain decks to feel properly pressured. Um, and they go into that here as well. Just a little bit more context in these patch notes. Again, I love the context here that they are including. Uh, Bandle Tree, again, not nerfed this patch. Um, they have changes planned for the Bandle Tree to alleviate the lack of interactivity in its win condition, but the changes are more complex to implement, so we have that targeted for our next balance patch, April 27th. April 27th is the uh, day we all want to look forward to for the next batch of Elite Supremacy changes, and uh, hopefully a reversion to She Who Wanders. Who knows if it'll have enough time to catch on. Um, but Twin Disciplines... I really, really think they should have just put Twin Disciplines back at three mana. Um, they say here that they realize that these combat tricks were a big part of what made it so hard to answer opposing threats. And, you know, Sharp Sight plus two plus two is like still having the plus two HP is great for defensive purposes. They felt that if you wanted to run these, they wanted they wanted them to be defensive. They didn't want them to also have offensive application, which which I can definitely appreciate with Sharp Sight. Protecting your units, but not being able to efficiently uptrade with weaker units certainly is going to hurt a lot of like very swarmy decks um, that are just making use of the raw mana efficiency. The biggest problem with Twin Disciplines wasn't really the attack, right? This, okay, this tones down Lee Sin a little bit, right? Um, you aren't going to be healing as much with Eye of the Dragon, etc., etc. But the, the big issue was certainly just the plus three HP. It's two mana, give plus three HP. It covers way too many options. Um, a lot of damage-based removal just can't really keep up with Twin Disciplines. You have to use your damage-based removal plus like a Challenger or some other effect or swing in order to fully cover Twin Disciplines. And a lot of those options also play into just getting blown up by Concussive Palm or Deny or Nopify or something in tandem with the Twin Disciplines threat. Keeping two mana open is very, very easy to do. And I, I think that this still is going to remain a, an unhealthy card because I think like 99% of the time you're only using it for the plus three HP to protect your board setup and not really caring about threatening lethal. It mattered a little bit in like the RE Kennen meta game where Twin Disciplines could come through to give you your big combo finisher. But a lot of those decks were just like, okay, well, Twin Disciplines protects my RE, protects my Kennen, protects my Dancing Droplet. And I can just uh, keep chump blocking you, cycling cards, playing defensively, and then just wait for go hard or for you to run out of resources. And then um, you're, it doesn't matter if I can buff up my Ari's attack power for a big combo or not, right? Um, and that was certainly the, the biggest issue I had with, uh, with the list. I guess that toning down the attack 
means that Ionia doesn't get to abuse Quick Attack as much, like Zed and Ari and Kennen. But um, I would have preferred that Twin Disciplines get bumped up to three and again open up more room for Ionia to receive buffs in other places because this Twin Disciplines nerf. If they were going to nerf it, they shouldn't have been so stubborn. They should have nerfed this a, a thousand years ago. And there were so many like terrible metagames that could have maybe they could have opened up some extra interaction if they had nerfed Twin Disciplines, right? Like Aurelia Azir, uh, Poppy Zed, um, and, and Ari Kennen, right? If they didn't have this powerful two mana defensive tool, it, it would have been a lot easier to disrupt them and keep them from getting set up keep them from pushing that advantage you usually had to rely on your opponent to draw poorly or to misplay by not keeping that mana open to feel like your interaction was was uh truly safe right this is probably one of my biggest disappointments for the patch is uh them not just putting twin disciplines back at three um king jarvin getting a little bit of a buff uh going up to a five six the king is a potent effect when his son is around, but hasn't been much of a ruler in his own right. With a little more power, he can do more to hold the throne. I mean, the, the thing about King Jarvan is that he doesn't do anything, right? He's, he's a blank. I said this when King Jarvan III was revealed, is he's a blank card, right? He's seven mana, so you can never play King Jarvan III and Jarvan IV in the same turn. Um, and... If you don't have a Jarvan already in play, he doesn't do anything. Drawing Jarvan is great, but you still can't make use of him for like another round or two. And then you miss out on the timing of this powerful ability on King Jarvan III regardless. Um, and if you play a 7-mana 5-6, right, then your opponent's just going to stun this thing and kill you anyway. Or use some other just mechanic that removes one big target or doesn't care about you developing one big thing if it's a wider aggressive board, this, this really doesn't change much about King Jarvan III's playability. Um, even in the decks uh, or the metas or the, or the games where Jarvan was seen, you know, you ran that deck without King Jarvan III because you don't want to draw your Jarvan on, on seven and then use him on round eight. You want to have him on turn six so he comes down with that massive, like, challenging strike with barrier against something to kill your opponents like really big target and truly swing the game back in your favor um so i would prefer that king jarvan the third gets something else uh, i mean a seven mana five six with tough is okay but when you compare his stat line to other uh seven drops he's still not trading hyper favorably um so this is uh still a I'm glad they identified that this card was so weak and they're trying to help it a bit, but they could have certainly gone farther with this, um, way farther with this. If they wanted to especially make like a later game Demacia style uh, deck viable, or especially as they gear up to give more help towards elites, maybe that's why they didn't push this too hard. Maybe they have a big plan for uh, Jarvan elites to get even more ridiculous because didn't they buff Jarvan the fourth? like three or four times like they just made him super super ridiculous and he still doesn't see play because he, he again he's just not impactful enough even when because because he eats all of your mana on that big swing um you don't have any reactivity to your opponent's uh you know response to that attack a lot of the time so you kind of already need to be ahead and then j4 becomes just like a win more card You'd like to take a more measured response to developing that turn and threatening your opponent with a lot of mana so that they are like, you know, chagrined, I think is the word I want to use, into really not trying to interact with you too much as you further your game plan. There's a nice change to Tattered Banner so that uh, Quinn <laughs> uh, can be played to get Challenger. Uh, this is actually very nice for Scouts. There are some builds of Scouts that were running the Penitent Squire and the Vanguard Sergeant. And who knows if, you know, a change like this that incentivizes that elite plus Quinn synergy might make Vanguard Redeemer uh, a little bit more of a in stronger inclusion in the deck as well. They also run Sithria the Bold, which is an elite. So again, this is just a, a nice quality of life change. Um, 
but who knows if it truly matters, especially with, again, uh, Sharp Sight getting nerfed a little bit, with Vanguard Sergeant getting nerfed a little bit. I think that Scouts are actually still in a really good spot um, with a lot of these Swarmy decks getting touched a little bit, running a less early game. Lurk v Scouts was already a bit of a 50-50, and Lurk is getting toned down, so you don't get that uh, really strong blowout against a turn three misfortune, potentially. Um, Scouts doesn't really care about Rocket Barrage. Maybe they fear Celestial Wonder a little bit, but again, with Targon, they are supposed to be weaker to wide boards, so if you're only stopping two attackers, then it's still a lot of damage coming through. I'm really curious if Scouts is still going to continue its reign. I think that the previous metas we've had, this 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 meta game, I suppose, is probably been the longest stretch where Scouts have been very, very strong in the meta. Usually they rise to prominence and then the meta shifts against them and then they go away, but they've had a lot of staying power this time around. And I think that, you know, just with Ranger's Resolve being missed in these patch notes, which is another huge card I was advocating for uh, getting nerfed finally to two mana, I think that they are still in a position to play Sculptor on two, have that uh, Ranger's Resolve to threaten and just value trade you, right? Especially with the Sharp Sight nerf, other Demacia decks can't really threaten as much. Twin Discipline nerfs, right, means that you can't trade up into them as well, as efficiently. So... It's going to be the battle of uh, Targon versus Scouts, probably. And to be fair, I think that um, the modern era has really allowed Targon to have access to more early game as well, which helps massively versus Scouts, where they aren't just like tempoing you down and you aren't just relying on raw healing. Uh, Sacred Protector was changed. So rather than just being uh, a Shen boat with... Um, a really strong passive, it can also give barriers. So it enables a strong attack. This is the sort of thing that they should have done with, with J4, with J3, I mean, right? Where he needs to do something when he comes into play, right? Because, you know, if you have Shen in play, Sacred Protector is going to give you a copy of Stand United. But giving the barrier means that you're also able to slow your opponent down. If your opponent doesn't take an open attack, um, because they want to see you spend mana, they're afraid that you have combat tricks or something, you play the Sacred Protector and then you put a barrier on something, then suddenly whatever good attack it looked like they had is no longer there, is a great change to Sacred Protector. It's massive stats, the double attack with barrier um, is very, very cute, because you're essentially, like, you're... you're attackers become immune right because the way double attack works is you just get a normal quick attack and then the second strike is like a regular attack where both strike simultaneously so the first quick attack isn't going to absorb your barrier but the second attack will and uh i think that it just reinforces your barriers and this is honestly i'm wondering i think that this might make shen jarvin come back into prominence right with uh sharp sight again being oriented as a more defensive card twin disciplines being oriented as a more defensive card um the sorts of board based decks maybe being more limited in their aggressive potential allows these uh shen jarvin decks to truly come out of the woodwork they still aren't going to run jarvin the third right you're obviously going to run sacred protector instead um and we've seen these decks like say okay do i want to just go for value and then finally rally to kill you am i going to run scattered pod to tutor for the golden aegis or do i just want to go big ham with tiana crown guard or bright steel formation sigil of malice getting a little bit of love we don't want sigil of malice to become a premier damage spell without reputation it can afford to be a little less embarrassing that's a great way to put it this this card was definitely embarrassing uh this change only affects the base cost the cost after reputation is still one um, and what's funny, too, is that reputation, I cost one because that is like a stated cost. You can't like prank Sigil of Malice or, or change its cost. Once you hit reputation, it's always going to be one cost. Um, and this is not the change to LeBlanc I was hoping to see. A really big miss here. If they were looking at the reputation archetype, there was a lot more they certainly could have done for that archetype. And it's one of my favorites that I like to play. So hopefully LeBlanc will get a little bit more 
uh, love in the next uh, balance patch. Calculated Creations getting a bit of uh, play here. Now it just grants the unit you select plus one plus one, which maybe plays well into Victor. I think Ballistic Bot is still a fantastic card that a lot of people forgot about. Giving the Android that plus one plus one is also pretty tight. Um, you can think of this a bit like Iterative Improvement, where again, you're getting a really powerful unit, and then you're also giving it plus one plus one at burst speed. So if there's not anything specific that you want to double down or triple down on, then Calculated Creations comes through to give you that Neandroid or Ballistic Bot for that uh, finishing potential. But for all intents and purposes, you know, this card is just, you're probably going to be running Iterative Improvement regardless. Uh, next up is Flash Bomb Trap. Uh, actually, you know what I'm thinking about is I wonder if Calculated Creation should be Victor's uh, champion spell. Would that be too strong? Because Death Ray is pretty bad. Unless you're running like Hexcore Foundry and you can draw extra cards through your deck. That's something to think about. Anyway, Flash Bombs, instead of going to the top 10 cards, now going to the top 8 cards. So they uh, activate a bit more quickly, a bit more consistently. Um, with no other changes to the flash bomb package, which I can accept. I was hoping they could maybe make Justice Rider and Sting Officer not just completely unplayably bad cards. We're seeing a lot of presence from Caitlyn and Piltover Peacemaker at the very least. And so making the flash bomb traps better just means that, you know, that Caitlyn Ezreal tri-beam deck becomes a little bit better. Uh, careful prep getting shifted to two mana. Um, and this was a card that always had a lot of strong potential, but was just always too expensive to justify running. Uh, and what it does is you put a card from your hand back into your deck, you predict, and then you create an exact copy of the card you put into your deck back into your hand. So you just get an extra copy of a card and then a predict which is amazing. Uh, this again lets you just have that extra protect for extra for uh, Echo Zillion. Um, lets you uh, just get extra like fallen felines and things like that. There's some other shenanigans that we can do with this that I'm sure I can't even think of right now. Uh, this is great for shell folk, right? Where it's just another cheap option that you can get an additional copy of a card of because this is going to give you two copies of the chosen card now. Um, so, Shirima Shellfolk, I mean, especially with, uh, again, Quicksand being such a ridiculous defensive tool now, I think that that's going to be uh, the meta we might end up in. With Quicksand being able to stop, like, aggression, wide boards, elusives, and then you just play Shellfolk, and we've got... Uh, I wonder how... And then, oh, I'm just like, spitballing the the it seems really strong Ikedo is probably just just salivating at these patch notes right now camp for the doubt also getting a lot of love uh becoming a 6-5 base um granting overwhelming challenger rather than having to target allies six times you target allies four times um and ruin runner right again the overwhelm plus spell shield and challenger so you're able to pick even better trades for yourself is actually godlike um and this isn't like grant vulnerable where maybe if your opponent's board is in a certain state they can make it so that the vulnerable goes onto a target that can kill camp for the doubt no the challenger means that you are going to be choosing your your targets and challenger is a keyword that targon typically uh does not have a lot of access to unless they jump through a lot of hoops like the Scourge and stuff. We saw how strong it was with Boxtopus and those Crescendum decks because giving Targon access to that sort of like select your target tempo answer was too good. The fact that this is late game as a finisher is also uh, quite astounding. So I think that Camper the Doubt does have a chance to see some real play because you don't need to necessarily run this in a purely faded, uh, dedicated deck. You just have to uh, target allies. And, you know, with things like Sunblessed Vigor, Pale Cascade, um, 
who knows if uh, maybe even running this as a finisher in Nightfall with Unto Dusk, Pale Cascade, Fading Memories. Hmm. Probably too. It's probably too uh, inconsistent. But again, the, the important thing with changes like this is to sort of just make you start thinking about decks. I think that just my initial read on the patch notes is we're going to see a lot of Freljord control for sure, because it's just like if you get to this is just get to round 10, you win. So a lot of Freljord control. Um, we don't have to do any shenanigans around trying to get to feel the rush. She who wanders probably just set your opponent far enough behind where they can't realistically threaten you anymore. Uh, Freljord control, a little bit of scouts, um, especially with Rangers Resolve helping out versus the Freljord matchup. Uh, Shen Jarvin could be a big thing. Maybe not even Jarvin. Shen with uh, Shivana or Garen could be an interesting idea. Um, just because Sacred Protector maybe gives you that that late game, that that turn seven pressure, which could be quite good. And Shellfolk also in the mix. Uh, Shellfolk just kind of invalidating a lot of late game options. If you prank She Who Wanders, increase its cost. Uh, well, no, actually, when you prank a unit, you can't increase its cost. But um, you can make it weaker, get a copy of She Who Wanders for yourself. But she who wanders uh, obliterate shell folk. How do, I wonder how that dynamic really goes. I suppose if you're running Shereem and shell folk, you run triple right of negation and you can stop this from blowing you out of the game. So there's something there. There's going to be like uh, Targon shell folk with Aphelios and then Sharima shell folk um, with using quicksand and right of negation. And I wonder which one will uh, take the, the top spot. And who knows? Maybe there is some unseen Victor meme here that I'm not seeing. They're also upgrading the, uh, I actually want to tune into this because this is, this is pretty important where they are adding additional functionality to the UI where you don't need to hover the eye in order to see like the two spiderlings are representing two damage here. And then um, you just get better, more in real time shifting of how combat's going to play out they have these uh beautiful blue cracks that show up right when a unit is uh going to die in combat to you know give you more of an idea of when and where and how you should be using your combat tricks again uh everybody makes mistakes and so as they as i've advocated for maybe start moving towards adding more complexity to the game the combats and board states are going to get a little bit more harder to parse. And so this is just a nice little thing that they can do. And I wonder if they perhaps have gotten a lot of feedback, right? Perhaps from newer players that the combats are still a little bit harder to fully fathom without having to hover the eye constantly. This change to UI is also ironically very, very good for tournament spectating. Um, especially like during the seasonal tournaments, uh, working as a back end observer, I have to like hover the eye myself to like kind of figure out how combat is going to stack out. And so there's a much stronger visual aspect here of being able to still know what's going on when you're tuning into a game and spectating, especially as a newer player. This is hella ironic to me that they would add a feature like this that makes the game more watchable, but then they, you know, they aren't going to be doing the seasonal broadcasts anymore. Um, and then just new skins. I'm always kind of whatever when it comes to cosmetics. So it, you really have to be the target audience, in my opinion, for like sometimes you see a cosmetic that just speaks to you and you have to have it. And then there are other people who want all the cosmetics. They're collectors. And so I'm one of those that, you know, if I see a cosmetic that I 100 percent need, I'm going to get it. But I generally don't pick up tons and tons of cosmetics just for the sake of having them. And, you know, with Shen maybe rising to prominence here in the new set with the uh, protector buff. And uh, we've got an Infernal Pantheon, which is kind of cool. Infernal Swain, Infernal Galio. These are pretty cool. These are pretty tight. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big Swain enjoyer, so I probably will pick up the Infernal Swain. Um, I would have liked to maybe see Ravenous Flock get an update for its spell art. And I know that um, Riot had already said with the previous arcade event that they do want to do a pass 
and kind of add some extra like art updates and additional like bonuses to some of the skins they've released in the past. So I hope that, you know, Infernal Swain's Ravenous Flock shows one of these like fiery bats on it rather than the, uh, you know, rather than the bird. I think that that would be pretty cool. And I don't know how to get out of this uh, screen. But anyway, that's the end of the patch notes anyway, so I guess this is a fine uh, splash art to end on. Sick uh, Runeterra wallpaper, as always. Um, I Again, it's very important that they, the developers gave a lot more context about, you know, why the patch is the way it is, why they missed certain cards, just because they kind of had to lock in some changes before they had the next batch of data of like Yordles and Arms rising to prominence the way it did as they were about to go on break. And it always unfortunately does seem to happen that way, like around December when they went on like their holiday break that we were in these whenever the meta is just at its worst and the players are doom saying and everybody's on copium that Riot has to kind of do a a a patch where they can't go as far as they should because of these these breaks which again i'm totally fine that riot is taking breaks and not crunching etc um but uh, i think that the shift to uh perhaps some balanced patches that are a bit closer together um is something i really would like to see and now we can look forward to the next patch right april 27th where elites are getting buffed they're no doubt going to touch Bandal Tree, Yordles and Arms. Um, even if the meta shifts in such a way where Yordles and Arms isn't that big of a major player, I hope it does still get nerfed because it's one of those cards that's always going to be a time bomb and is very limiting to, you know, the sorts of new cards that they could potentially add. Um, and I'm looking forward to them adding more cards to the game to help certain archetypes. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in and hearing my thoughts. Uh, let me know what you thought was the biggest victory, the biggest mist of the current patch, and uh, what you're looking forward to uh, in potentially in the next patch. I'll see you next time, and you have a good one.